my presentation is not going to be a presentation I was thinking of, because I'm actually going to develop some themes, um, and I'm going to link those themes together, I hope, because I can normally get away with doing this, do it in 15 minutes and get to the pub. Me, I've been in this industry 33 years. I ran an IT magazine in the 80s called Computer Weekly. Those in the IT sector will remember the days of 120 pages. Uh, I remember my first job as an ad director at 25, ridiculous, I wouldn't have given me the job, uh, and our first £1 million month, unbelievable. The UK recruitment media industry used to be a £1.7 billion industry, today it's going to be £700 million. it will never go back again, because what we did in the job board world was totally disintermediate the rate card, and most of you guys came through the worst recession ever, because job boards were a cheap way to attract candidates. Um, I founded a magazine called Personnel Today, ran a couple of recruitment ad agencies and was very fortuitous in 1999 to get involved with a fledgling startup called TotalJobs.com. That was really cool. And for the last four or five years, I've kind of lived in New York, Amsterdam and Paris getting over a divorce, which was five years of absolute wonderful post-divorce on Match.com. And remember, recruitment and engaging with candidates should be exactly the same experience you get on Match.com. It's about content and it's about engagement. It's not about I need a CV, you, and guess what you're going to get if you upload a CV. It is a totally different experience, and we've not learnt it. I built a business about 18 months ago. Um, I began to hear a trend in the US two, three years ago called content. I thought, that's interesting. I've done a bit of publishing, had some journalists, and I've kind of done some creative work at an advertising agency, and I did a job board. I think I get content. And actually, that's what we do. And what we've built is a very small team of full-time people with a mix, I think when my team put this together, then they use the word experience, I meant old and youth. People who understand publishing and publishing technology, and um, what I'm really pleased about is we build a network of over 150 freelance journalists. In any one month, we're producing about 200 articles. We do not do cut and paste hack jobs. There are people like Advar that will do that quite admirably. We write content, we write articles. We work with our clients to build a thing called an editorial program. Why? Because every single one of you in this room today is a publisher. Every time you tweet, you are publishing. Every time you put something on Facebook, you are publishing. Every time you write a blog, you are publishing. Every time you should send something to your database, which is your most valuable asset, if you did it properly, you're in publishing. Problem is most of you don't realize it because actually you do the core job you do, which is actually putting bums on seats and making a fee for doing it. And things like marketing tend to get in the way a lot of what we do. And I've got a great creative team who win RAD awards, and we call it branded engagement. We have a range of clients. Um, we're really lucky in this room. This morning we had in-house recruiters. I've done a lot of work over the years in helping in-house recruiters, building really smart in-house recruiting teams, and increasingly working with them to help them, what I call, build a resourcing toolkit that makes them really good recruiters. And my last project was to work with a very large FMCG brand to build an RSS feed of over 500 blogs that their recruiters can use to post content into the various channels they want to be engaging with, including Twitter, Facebook, and all of the others, including Pinterest, because content is king. But we work with job boards, we work with corporate recruiters. We also, and how many of you in this room are members of AppSco? Okay, well, we just... We do the new AppSco little news bulletin, so my company published that. We've launched this week um, the team new newsletter. Uh, we also work with uh, a lot of in-house recruiting businesses to help them provide content. And actually, we work with quite a lot of vendors to help them develop content. Examples of our work, we do newsletter programs to engage with candidates. I happen to think that your candidate database actually should be a candidate relationship management tool and something that you should be engaging with regularly. I am staggered. We send out about a million emails a month. I'm staggered at how many recruitment consultancies I work with. Um, this is being live streamed, so I've got to be careful. Maybe things like the Data Protection Act actually should be read and taken seriously, and updating data every six months actually might be a good idea. I'm also staggered how many recruitment consultancies do not seed their client database and a seed means you put in made up names so that when one of your staff tries to nick your database when they leave, you actually know they've nicked it. I'm really surprised at some of the things I see going on in this industry still. And I talk regularly with Anne Swain at AppSco and she says, why are you surprised? You've been in the business 31 years. We actually haven't changed that much. But that's just an example of some of the work we do. Technology. I absolutely love technology, but I despair often the way in which we treat it. You need to know why you want it. Um, I got some stats from the US recently. Um, and 
with a much more informed audience. Um, recruiter pal of mine said, today we reckon in the US the average recruiter is placing somewhere between 2.7 uh, and 3.5 candidates per month. Now, I don't know whether that's the same in the UK, whether it's good or bad. Obviously, it depends on the level you're operating at. I said, oh, that's okay. What was it like 20 years ago? Exactly the same. So despite the huge investments in technology, I do sometimes question whether we are actually making and delivering the kind of ROI. If we'd actually set out from the very start and said, what do we want to deliver back for the investment we put in? And the issue is, if actually all you're going to do is remain competitive with your competitor, it's a good reason, but if you walked into the Dragon's Den and put that up as a case study, I'm not sure whether they actually back you. So what is the competitive edge? What is the ROI you're going to try to deliver for any investment in any technology? And with some of them like LinkedIn, it's really easy. If you're making a lot of placements, you know what each placement is, you know what your ROI is. With others, it becomes much more difficult. You need to think about what are going to be those must-have and nice-to-haves. And I completely concur with Dan. If you're going to use social media, spamming Twitter with job postings is a death wish. It will do your brand more damage. It might be free. And I'm sure there was a stat somewhere I once saw that said you have to have, to have 52 retweets of an ad to get one response. I'm sure you'll know more than I would about that. But you've got to be posting a lot of wallpaper to Twitter. Now, if you want to do it smartly... The smart thing to do with Twitter is if your target audience are pharmaceutical salespeople, go and find 10 great pharmaceutical blogs or a couple of really top-notch sales blogs and actually feed in the occasional article on five tips to being a great salesman, seven tips to being a great sales manager, and mix and match your, co your content with postings. How many of you, when you're on Twitter, find a smart article and you click on the link and you go, that's a really interesting piece, and you follow that person? Twitter is the ultimate library. We look at it for content, and yet so often recruitment consultancies and corporate recruiters spam it. Um, what are going to be those nice things to have? And finally, the biggest challenge of all I find in many organisations, who is going to own all of this? Is it the CEO? Is it the MD? Is it the chief exec? If you're a five-strong recruitment consultancy startup, one of you needs to take ownership of what I call the technology. And I include your Facebooks, your Twitters, and your LinkedIn to me because they are technology-based tools that you're going to use as part of your business. But actually, I don't think we're in the technology business. I think we've spent billions of pounds feeding the technology business. But actually, I think this is the business we're in, and I still believe it to this day. I also still, and I once was a real recruiter. I actually was an IT contract recruiter many years ago, uh, working in South London for a very interesting character who went on to run my football club, Crystal Palace, and nearly drove us into the ground, bless him. Um, recruitment is about people. Candidates still like to get a call. They really do. They want to be engaged with. Recruitment actually is about content. There's an interesting trend. The reason Indeed is so big is because it has more jobs than anyone else, because it aggregates content from as many channels, and therefore the propensity for the candidate to find a job increases exponentially. And guess what? Candidates are pretty smart. If they know there's a site that's got one million jobs as opposed to a site that's got 50,000 jobs, they go to it. Exactly the same trend in the print industry. When Computer Weekly used to have 20 pages of recruitment and Computer now 120, we got less response than they did, even though the other magazine had 120 pages. Because when you build large volumes of content, the audience follow. The reason why LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook have so, been so successful is because they have huge volumes of content. They were originally, we used to talk about it, user-generated content. And once you've got content, you build audience. Once you've got audience, you can start to monetize it. Um, so recruitment is about dialogue, it's about engagement. We hear this word engagement a lot. Um, I'm sorry to say that when I do sit with my friends from Mapsco and team, one of the challenges you as recruitment consultants face is that over the last five, six years, it's been pretty tough out there. And most of you cannot have talked to every candidate that's hitting your career site. The problem is every time you don't communicate with somebody, every time you don't engage with somebody, you leave them with a pretty sour brand experience. At the moment, 
a lot of candidates are feeling very disengaged with you as an industry. They feel much more engaged with your LinkedIn's. Um, and it's an interesting take on this one. Um, you know, I shouldn't say this, but is LinkedIn your best friend or your best enemy? Because actually, it's not about a war for talent. The war in our industry for 30 years has been who owns your candidate? Is it you? Is it LinkedIn? Is it a job board? Is it a corporate with their career site? Because ultimately, there are only X number of people suitable for any one job. And the battle's always been, how can I engage with them and build a relationship with them that gives me competitive edge? Years ago, you guys were the primary place that job seekers went to find a job. Increasingly, they're talking about social media replacing your relationships with them because they feel more empowered by social media. They feel more, they get feedback. So there's a real battle going on. And your business and your brands are actually defined by the experience that you deliver to your candidates. But technology is no more than an enabler. We were talking this morning to a group of in-house recruiters, and it's a real polarisation. It really is the ultimate us and them um, about this thing called the, the 21st century recruitment cycle. It's very simple. We've lost control of the candidate. They are coming at us from every conceivable angle. They are turning up at your career site wanting to find information. They'd love to know who the employer really is. I know smart candidates now that will look at a, a recruitment consultancy and then see if they can actually work out who the client is and then go and approach the client direct through LinkedIn. Why? Because actually they know many of them now because we've got a sophisticated candidate that you guys are actually making a fee on it. And maybe they can trade that knowledge with an in-house recruiter to actually up their salary. It's a real war out there and we have a more and more informed candidate who understands more and more about what's going on. There are hundreds of career uh, bloggers these days blogging and giving careers advice, and people read this stuff, and they're like, wow, I didn't realise that. We live in a world today where actually it is so transparent. We know everything about everything, and everybody knows everything about everyone else's business. We are in this kind of reality world. But the recruitment cycle is just literally out of control, and it's spinning and spinning and spinning, and there's new technology and new toys coming through. This really doesn't relate to you guys, but it's interesting to talk to corporate recruiters who are building strong in-house teams. What are their challenges? And the reason I'm mirroring this is some of the learning I think you guys are, are in many instances, are actually ahead of many in-house recruiters. So one of the choices they have is around, am I going to use a full, great, big, heavy-duty applicant tracking system to process, or am I going to use a much lighter weight recruitment management system? Now, most of you guys, and I suspect everyone in this room, has some form of recruitment software. I can't imagine that anybody wouldn't, and if they do, they're probably making really good money out of a Rolodex, because I still think if you've got 100 candidates in a Rolodex and a telephone, you can make a very good living in this industry. Um, so you guys have got most of the technology out there, um, and I'm going to cover kind of what I'll call the front entrance in a minute. The other big discussion going on in in-house recruitment, which affects technology, is, well, am I going to build an in-house team, or actually am I going to RPO the whole lot? Because if you're going to RPO the whole lot, you don't actually need to invest a huge amount in recruiting technology. Big debates going on around branding. Are we going to build an in-house team that focuses on building a very strong attraction strategy, very powerful career site and attract? Or actually, am I going to be using LinkedIn and other sources to source candidates? And there's a really interesting development going on there where I think you're going to see actually in-house recruitment teams really developing their, what I would call, sourcing skill sets. And they really are becoming very sophisticated in areas like talent mapping, talent management. Um, and I think that's a potential threat and an opportunity. Um, talent pool be talent puddle. Um, before the internet came along and online recruitment came along, some of us in the early adoption world thought that in this new world, we would realize that the candidate can now be engaged with candidate relationship management equals customer relationship management. The candidate is often a customer and or a consumer. And we kind of thought, well, these new tools would enable us to communicate with candidates. Actually, what we've ended up with is something worse than what used to be the filing cabinet. At least in the filing cabinet, you'd have your IT, your IT candidates in one filing cabinet, actually normally done by name alphabetically. You've had your customer support in another filing cabinet. You could find them. In so many CV databases, if you talk to many of the big corporate recruiters, biggest challenge they've got is their technology doesn't allow them to really search properly 
those kind of candidate pools. And so for you guys often have huge competitive edge if you've structured your databases properly because you should be able to drill and, and drill down and find candidates quicker than they can. Um, I think that's a competitive edge. And finally, do you want to build a relationship with a candidate or treat it as a CV database? And there's a fundamental difference. Um, the guy that invented Tesco's club card um, could have invented Tesco's club card and for a whole year maybe he would have driven in a million people into the club card. But if he'd not had one single email communication with those, one peop those, those people, Tesco's would have still sacked him. In this industry, we build bigger and bigger databases of information we don't communicate with them. We don't tell them what's going on. We don't engage with that candidate. Career site, I think, is less relevant for you guys, but what I do think is if I look at most recruitment consultancy sites, they're not very nice. They tend to focus way more on trying to sell you to your potential new business leads as opposed to actually offering what most candidates want when they come to any site online, which is I want to find a job, or I want to register for a job, or I want to upload my C CV, or I want to do alert. Um, and the amount of recruitment consultancy sites I see that you have to drill down a couple of pages sometimes to actually start to find jobs, or the minimum you'll get is a little job search on the top left or right hand side. Every site we build for clients, we put the careers site search element slap bang in the middle of the whole page. Search for a job, search for a job, find a job, sign up for a careers newsletter, register for an email alert. Um, but too often I see it's hidden behind your own marketing, what I almost call brochure online. Um, just some examples of people we've done work for, shameless plug, take that out, that one's irrelevant. Um, and interesting enough, just recently, um, some guys at a company called Format um, did some really nice research into what do actually people really want from a, you know, a good career site. And the answer is they want to be able to do a simple job search. They want to browse. They don't want to be hit with a 20-page apply online. Um, hence why I use the analogy. Actually, they want to do more like what you do in the dating world or the early world of LinkedIn. And those remember LinkedIn four or five years ago. You'd sign up. You'd fill a couple of bits out. And you thought, yeah, you know what? I'm not sure about this. Then a couple of days later, you get that little email. If you actually fill out an extra 15% of this, 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 and this, it will enhance your opportunity to find a job by this, this, and this, and this. That was based on the very much that match.com model. But interestingly enough, what we do in recruitment is we bring them onto the career site, they apply for a job, and then we hit them with a 20-page document, or send this, or do that, or do the other. Maybe they just want to communicate with you. Um, profiles, case studies, and videos, great content. Really, really good content. You know, get clients to give you video case studies. They work so well. Um, and keep in touch with people. Um, choosing an ATS, really actually, to my extent, irrelevant for you guys. But if you are looking at your next recruitment software supplier, this works as well with, whether you're looking for a recruitment software supplier or whether you're a corporate looking for an applicant tracking system. It's the same process. And actually, it's a really good set of steps to go through that will help you end up with the right vendor. And the one thing I would say, and I said it this morning, most of you, I suspect, don't have to put up with purchasing. Most, unfortunately, corporate recruiters do. But actually, if you engage with your technology supplier as a business partner, you'll get so much more out of them than if you do treat them as a pure process of trying to get the price down to the lowest possible amount. This was really interesting this morning. I asked the audience, how many of you use a multi-posting tool? So all corporate recruiters or HR, no more than 10, 15% of the audience put their hands up. So how many of you are using a multi-posting tool? Yeah, it's really interesting, most of you. And those that aren't do, um, because actually it's a great opportunity to do all the things that Dan talked about. And by the way, it was a long time ago when I was involved with, 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 with the guys at Broadbeam. To me, it's the most logical thing to do in the world. We are actually in the channel management business. Not just job boards, I love job boards, they're not dead. Job boards will come back. But you're also into putting your jobs onto other channels. So actually, channel content distribution is critical, and jobs is the most powerful bit of content you've got. Sometimes you wouldn't believe it when you look at the copy that people write, but that's another issue, and I won't get on my high holes. But it does enable you to actually monitor the banks for bucks. You know where you're getting your return on investment from. 
you know which of those channels are delivering, you can start to drill down and identify, well, is social media going to work for me? And if it is, what's the investment I need to put in to make it work, and what's going to be the return on that investment? I'm not going to talk about social media other than LinkedIn, awesome. Facebook, I think it is an amazing platform. I call, I call Facebook an ecosystem. When it busts through the one billion mark this year, um, Zuckerberg has been spectacularly brilliant in everything he's done other than the IPO. Um, but he did walk out with a decent amount of cash, I suppose, who am I to talk? Um, but what they've got is this incredible audience. They've built an audience. They've built a platform. And you will find more and more people will plug into that platform. So Facebook now enables you not just to create tabs. And tabs are very static. You can't do anything with the tag. It's like buying a little piece of... It's like buying a poster. You just put some stuff up and you change it and you put it up and down. Facebook are going to massively push apps. You're going to see an explosion in Facebook apps. And Facebook apps enable you to be completely interactive. You can build a complete corporate career site inside Facebook that can have all of your jobs. It's searchable and it can do all of the things that your career site will do. Now, if you've got 31.9 million people in the UK who are on Facebook, and some of them spend up to 79% of their time on the internet now on Facebook, having inside their page apps when they want to apply and look for a job, apps when they want to look for a new apartment in London, and that's the next big thing I happen to think, Facebook's going to explode. But they've been really smart in building the channel, building huge amounts of content. Now they'll start to monetize it. Um, Facebook's also great because it's a brilliant branding platform. I happen to think that the tabs are great for branding. And you want to take people from the tab to apply swiftly, and that's where I think the apps will come in. And as for Twitter, I absolutely love it, but as I said, posting jobs to Twitter to me is akin to just putting wallpaper paste on a wall. It's just horrible and it smells. Sorry. Um, mobile, massive fan of mobile. How many of you in here have got a mobile app? Great. How many of you have got a mobile enabled website? Brilliant. That's the priority. Despite the fact I love apps, mobile website, M site, number one priority. There are also two different strategies. Your site is a pull strategy. You pull people to you. Your app is a push strategy. The trick with an app is to realize that apps actually aren't really, although you can with technology being developed and now apply online as well. But apps to me are about pushing content out to people. They're about getting people to do sign up for push email notifications. So if you've got a candidate that's going in for an interview, make sure they download the app and say, by the way, the day before, we're going to send you five top tips on how you can crack that interview. We're going to send you the directions to the interview. Uh, this is what I say to corporate recruiters. With corporate recruiters, the thing I love about app is you can start doing things like onboarding strategies. App is a perfect tool for developing an onboarding strategy to keep them engaged during that three months when every other so-and-so is going to try to persuade them not to leave the job with counter-offers or four or five other recruitment consultants are going to try to make them another good offer. So to me, the app is a brilliant push strategy, very powerful. But when you're looking at, at the moment, some of the big job boards are getting 25, 26, 27 percent of their traffic from smart devices at a big amount of traffic. So make sure your site is mobile enabled. Okay, and all this will be made available. Um, not going to talk about the, the, the future of work, but I do think you guys are in an incredibly powerful position. Um, some research coming out of a, a thing called the, the Future of Work Foundation is expecting that over the next 20 years, we will see a move of those people who are in effect working contingency from a global average of about 20% to up to 40% of us will be working on a contingency basis. Um, in parts of Europe, we're already at 38, 39, 40% already. Um, and interestingly enough, that provides new opportunities. Because suddenly, if you've got an audience, if you've got candidates who are working on contingency, you can start to bolt in new products and services. There's a fantastic site in Germany that's a recruitment consultancy site but actually it also handles all of your tax and everything else you might want to do. It provides a complete suite, a complete toolkit that actually helps their 40% that are working on contingency manage everything they do. Uh, I think that's going to be one of the, uh, one of the big things in our, in our industry going forward. Um, 
And as for recruiters, I think this applies for you as, as well as in-house recruiters. Unfortunately today, you are marketeers. You have to be PR specialists. In my opinion, you've got to be candidate relationship management specialist to keep your candidates engaged. You're expected to produce mobile and video. You've got to be creating and finding content to position yourself smartly intelligent in front of your audience. And some poor science has got to do all of that. And we're all trying to do everything that I've just put up there with less money and or no money. So it's an interesting world. And we've got a fragmented audience. Sorry, I shouldn't mention that. A bit like TV, our audience is ever more fragmented. They're going wider and wider and narrower and narrower. Um, and that makes it really difficult to keep your profit margins up when your candidates are everywhere, your clients are saying, well, actually, we're going to go in-house, um, and you're expected to compete. So it's going to be a fun time, but I think the opportunities are huge. And I said this this morning, what you cannot beat is a really great niche recruitment consultancy who knows their sector upside down, who knows every candidate in that sector upside down, and no in-house recruiter will ever compete with you because most in-house recruiters are actually generalists. We used to talk about the HR generalists. Now you've got in-house recruiters are generalists. But if you focus on and you know the SAP, ERP market really well, you can make a really great living. I think the generalist is going to be more of a struggle, but I think the specialist is a great future. Um, so for me, the future of recruitment is not about technology. It's about us. It's about people. Thanks a lot.